So first of all, I want to thank our sponsors, and I'd like to ask you to help me thank our sponsors. We have seven businesses that have all stepped up to support this series, including John Deere. I know some of the representatives from these companies are here tonight. John Deere, Green State Credit Union, Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, Northeast Iowa Community College, Hodge Companies, Cottingham and Butler, and tonight, our lead sponsor, and we'll hear from them in a minute, is the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sully here. Please help me thank all of our sponsors. You know, don't take this the wrong way, Sully. Don't take this the wrong way, but we got the B team here today. <laughs> Love Sully to death, but uh, our lead sponsor, uh, Molly uh, Chamber, had to be out in the event we've been running tonight at the airport. So apparently they trump us, at least for this few, first few minutes here. But we're actually ecstatic to have the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce do something about the Dan Sully. Thank you very much. The B thing is actually a compliment because it's more than I ever got in a great card, so I'll take it. On behalf of Molly Grover, our president and CEO, and the rest of the Dubuque Chamber, uh, we welcome you to TH Media's DEI series featuring a discussion around safe neighborhoods. The mission of the Chamber is to provide advocacy, connections, and education to create success for our members and the business community. Yes. The mission of these meetings is to provide safety in our neighborhoods, the most fundamental oh, Dale, you're good. You're good right there. I'm coming for the success of our entire Dale, you're live. community. Neighborhoods are where everyday life happens. Neighborhoods create communities. Neighborhoods set the geographical framework so residents, businesses, and government can act to resolve problems using the and practical solutions. Thank you to our friends and partners at TH Media for creating a series that provides a platform for meaningful and relevant conversations and topics in diversity, equity, and inclusion. In my simple mind, I like to look at it this way. Diversity is being invited to the party. Equity is extremely welcome at the party, and inclusion is being asked the Chamber is honored to be sponsored for tonight's event. We thank you all for making this event a priority in your day. This is provided by our friends at the Community Foundation for Great Review. Alex Baum is here to share a little bit of the data that they compiled both in the past and more recently. Alex? Thank you so much. want one of the, the really important parts of this whole process, which is for members of our community to come forward and have conversations about this, to be able to provide their input into these issues. And we do those through community conversations that are held yeah. around the city and by an online survey that you can take so to Dale, provide what you, want to what do you think about those is about frame them up to the right. about safe neighborhoods. So I'd ask each of you to please trim participate trim and to spread the, right the word through. about these so that we can make sure we hear from yeah, so our community left, residents about what is important for them and what their experiences have been. But getting back to the data, you, I want to begin when we're you talking about safe right neighborhoods, through. our minds normally go to the violent crime rate. This is the violent crime rate between 2014, which is the last time that we did a community equity profile, and 2021. And you can see that there, uh, it went up and then back down, and that there has been a rise to about 3.7 violent crime incidences per 1,000 people within our community. So for every 1,000 people, there have been 3.7 violent crime incidences. And you can see here that over the past couple of years is when that number has really increased and gone. So first, let's talk about that 3.7 number. Is that significant? Here is a breakdown of uh, nine other comparable locations across Iowa 
to Dubuque that we're trying to do a comparison of. And you can see here that the city of Dubuque, that 3.7 number, falls right kind of in the middle of most of them. You can see that increase there. But, but it's about average for these cities. But we also want to dig a little bit deeper into that, because you might have noticed that it's the last couple of years that we've seen that increase. These are the number of violent crime incidences that we have seen between 2014 and 2021. Here are the number of offenders of violent crimes who were not known to their victim. So, violent crimes committed by strangers. You can see during that same time period, the number actually went down. So while in 2014, we had 27 offenders linked to a violent crime, in 2021, we only had 26. The vast majority of violent crimes in 2021 were committed by individuals who were known, who had a relationship with their victim. So when we think about violent crime in the movement, the numbers seem to indicate that it is not somebody walking down the street and being mugged or attacked in most instances. It is people who know each other. And that spike during 2020 and 2021 is likely linked to the stresses of the pandemic and what people were experiencing in their own home. When we look at these numbers, the percentage of violent crime incident offenders who were strangers, who were not known to their victim, you can see that Dubuque has a much smaller percentage than most of those other cities that we've listed. And places like Chicago or other large cities are usually around the 25% to 30%. So in this regard for violent crime, we come out a lot lower than a number of other places. Uh, in addition to violent crime, we also want to take a look at property crime. So here are again those locations across Iowa with property crime rates for 2014 and for 2021 per thousand people. So here you can see for Dubuque, that number dropped by about six uh, property crime incidences per thousand people during that time period. And we come out again above some but below others in terms of property crime rates. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to take a look at, um, and here you can see kind of a, a bar going across so you can see the comparison. But the next thing we also wanted to take a look at was uh, driving under the influence arrest rates and uh, arrest rates for drunkenness, uh, because this was something that was brought up during some of our previous data discussions that people were very interested and wanted to be able to see. So you can see generally we have seen a decline since 2010 in a lot of these numbers. Um, uh, going through with the blue number being driving under the influence and the orange number being uh, arrest rates for drunkenness. Now the thing that I'll point out to a lot of people is this 2014 number. People ask what, what the heck happened during 2014? Um, it turns out that there was a change over in the data collection and processing that the City of Dubuque Police Department used during that period of time. So this number here is probably inaccurate. I've included it just for transparency, but there is a note that this number is probably a lot closer to what it was the year before and after than this spike that we're seeing right now. Next, an important thing to look about when we talk about uh, these uh, crime rates within our city is to look at the racial and ethnic disparities. So what we have here is we've taken for violent crime and uh, drug and narcotics violations the disparity between the rate of black offenders, so the number of black offenders per a thousand people of, uh, who are black within our community, and the rate of white offenders per 1,000 people within the white population. What is the difference between those numbers? And if we look at violent crime right now, and we zoom in to Dubuque, you can see that we had a very significant decrease between 2014 and 2021 of the, the disparity between those two rates. Now, that, that's certainly a positive, but again, if you then compare with a lot of the other cities on that list, you're still much more towards the high end of all those different cities. When we look at drug and narcotic 
violations, we can also see that there has been a decrease since 2014 to 2021. But again, for the 2021 rate, we actually come out as the highest disparity within these numbers. So that can be something that we have a conversation about over the month as we talk about safety improvements. Moving along, because we want to get to the panel conversation here, another important issue that people have brought up are clearance rates. This means the number of violent crime offenses that come before the city and the police that are actually resolved in some way, that are clear. And you can see here that we have about a 22% greater clearance rate within the city of Dubuque than the national average. And uh, looking across that whole list of cities, we come in clearly at the highest rate of clearance out of any one of these different cities. Now the last thing that I want to talk about is when we think about safe areas, we think about walkability and we think about uh, different regards for when we're out in our community, is it a community that uh, we want to be out in, walking around during, uh, during the day with our families. This is a look at the percent of the population within a 10 minute walk of a park. And so when we zoom into this map here, you can see the dark green are the parks, the light green are the areas with good access to a park, and the purple areas are those areas that, that don't have readily available walking access to parks. Zooming out again here, we also have a breakdown by race and ethnicity, by um, uh, age, and by income level. Now, a couple of things that I want to point out, about 67% of our population lives within a 10 minute walk of a park. Those numbers jump up to 84.6% for our black community, and 82.1% for Pacific Island community. And when we look at the income breakdown, it is our low income population at 72.8%, which has the highest access to parks. Yeah. Um, so this is a, an interesting thing. It's something that a lot of us may not have assumed upon not seeing this data beforehand, but this is what the breakdown shows us. Finally, I want to look at that 67% and see, is this good for our area? When we compare it to those other cities around Iowa, uh, city of Dubuque is on the far left. We see that we come in about, a minute. I think, out of these 10 different locations, we're number six. So, above some and below some. So that's a quick breakdown of the data. A lot of this data is available on the side for you to come and look at it in more detail. Now we want to get to the main event and talk with our panel of experts about what is taking place with safe neighborhoods in our community. So I'm going to turn it back over to Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Let me thank Alex for that. I love Prezi. Prezi is such a great presentation device and the data is, is informative. What I didn't mention a little bit ago is that I'm going to be taking notes, hopefully you will be too, but I'm going to be taking notes during the uh, presentations tonight, the panel discussion, and at the end, I'll come back and join you and share with you some of my notes and some of my takeaways from tonight's conversation. So, let's go ahead and welcome our moderators. We have from TH Media, Amy Gilligan, and from the City of the View, Anderson Sancy. Those are our two uh, moderators, and I'd ask our uh, panelists to come on up and, and grab their seats, or, in the, or wheel on up, and we'll get started here in just a second. Testing. Testing. All good. We can kind of pass the microphones back and forth so we can share those a little bit. Uh, thank you everybody for being here tonight. We've got some great panelists assembled. So what I'd like to do for, with these folks is to start off with, we'll just go down the line and I'd like you to introduce yourselves to the folks here. Let them know who you are and kind of how you're connected to this issue of safe neighborhoods. Hi there, my name is Enoch Sanchez. Um, I am a financial professional for New York Life, but then I'm also one of the Latino committee uh, members. I'm one of the founding members of the Latino Fiesta that started in 2021, happened last October, and we're going to have another one this September 30th as well. Lived in the Butte now 10 years, uh, originally from the city of New York. I was born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, 
so I have spent a lot of time speaking to our Latino population uh, and some of the other minority groups uh, in town specifically about whether or not they feel safe, whether or not they feel included. Uh, so I have taken the time, I love talking to people, uh, and I do ramble, so we'll see how this goes. Hi everybody, my name is Tim Perry, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with the City of Dubuque in the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support. And so one of my roles is being able to uh, be within the community and help connect uh, residents to neighborhood associations and help, help them uh, be able to feel whatever community looks like for them, as well as uh, being able to connect residents to our local government. Hi, I'm Lori Olendick. Basically a lifelong debuter minus a couple years. Uh, five years ago, I had a surgery that had some complications and I woke up paralyzed. So my life has changed a lot and I look at life really differently being disabled. Part of what I wanted to do with that is to figure out where I could maybe plug in and um, bring some awareness and educate some people about the needs of the disability. And so, I've gotten involved with city government, which I'll be talking about, I'm sure, that further with questions. I also am a uh, mental health therapist in private practice. So in my work, I obviously work with people with mental health challenges, as well as some of them also have physical challenges and disabilities like myself. Hello everyone, I am Whitney Sanger. I was born and raised here in Dubuque, Iowa, and I now raise our six children with my husband here in Dubuque, and I'm proud to call it home. I work full-time full for the Hawkeye Area Community Action Program, which is a nonprofit here in the community, and then I co-founded a nonprofit as well called Project Rooted, which works on connecting kids to healthy local foods here in our community. Uh, so that's my main focus throughout this conversation, and I look forward to learning through you all and also sharing, too. Good evening. Uh, Jeremy Jensen. I'm the Chief of Police. We talk about safe communities, and the police are part of that, right? So that's how I'm connected to that. I've been in Dubuque 29 years now, and actually been in Dubuque longer than I've been anywhere else. So uh, I have a vested interest in Dubuque, and in that we as a community and as being living in this, uh, this city that we have a safe community and that, you know, I've raised my family here and all and, and actually to the point where my daughter moved back to the community because it's such a great community. So that's, this is something that we want to, uh, you know, as we talk about this, and we'll get into some of the questions, but it really is a community effort to make it a safe community. Jeremy, I, I want to dive right into the elephant in the room for many of us. We talk about Dubuque being a safe community. Is Dubuque a safe community? Yes, <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, and you look at you know the, the data that shows out here, and, and I think the biggest testament to a safe community. I literally have no place that I'm afraid to go. I have no place that I'm afraid my daughters to go. Uh, you know, I you look at the. And I appreciate the Community Foundation for digging into this, this data because that really is something that you look at and say, the strength in crime, you know, that, that's scary to me if you have strangers just robbing and doing the violent crime. And, and, and quite honestly, it's a little harder when people know each other. There, there's predictors that go into that. And so the, um, we don't see that. It's not, it's not running rampant, as you can see uh, on the statistical data. Uh, yeah, we saw some um, uptick in violent crime. That's nationwide. We're seeing that. This is, again, I, I think it's right on with, with the pandemic. And the other elephant that isn't part of this data is that the brain health. And we talk about the mental health. Our, our calls for service doubled the last two years on brain health. So, I mean, that's literally doubled. We ran a statistic of about 450 calls for service on that a year until the last two years were just skyrocketed. And I think that's another another issue that we were trying to address head on. Yeah, I think, yeah, you know, as Jeremy said, this this is, public safety is just one aspect of safe neighborhoods and we don't want to shy away from it. We want to, you know, that's why the police chief is here tonight. So, 
I want to I want to keep talking. There's kind of a lot of different subjects to cover here. But if you have specific questions around public safety, you know that that's why Chief Jeremy's here and uh, happy to address any of those. Let's talk. Just let me just ask you one more question, and and how much of it has to do? And and some of the others of you may want to jump in too. We talk a lot about you know, think about safe neighborhoods and where you're comfortable going into view, where some people may not be comfortable. Perception versus reality. So, from your standpoint, Chief, it's it's more of a perception issue than a reality. You know, the, the thing with perception, perception is real and it's effects, right? And so, if you don't feel safe, whether it's true or not, you're not going to feel safe. And, and that's the thing. You know, that's part of this is making everybody weighing in on that. You know, and saying, yeah, you know what, my neighborhood is safe. My neighborhood is 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 a good place to be. There's a lot of neighborhoods that are represented and they feel like they get a bum rap for their neighborhoods and they're like, look at this, we're vibrant, we got all these uh, things going on in our community, and, you know, and, you know, I, I look at the beauty and I look at it as, you know, not just kind of bad part of town, you have bad neighbors, you know, and that's what it, what it boils down to, and it may be two or three, but there is that, and so, you know, it's, when we talk about community, it's about us being together and learning to you know, being on that first name basis with people. Yeah, let's talk about sense of community, and all of you can weigh in on this. Tell me a little bit about um, how you feel that sense of community is developed here in Dubuque. Give me an idea of something we're doing right and maybe an area we need to work on, from your perspective. Ina, go ahead, you're the ramble. You'll start. Yeah. All right, well, as somebody who, uh, so I moved in August of 2013, went to a Mayor's Bible College. Uh, graduated from there. Um, you know, I came from the city of New York, came born and raised in the Bronx. So, you know, I know what it's like to see both sides of that spectrum. I know what it's like to see when you feel safe and when you really don't feel safe and what those two worlds look like. Now, something that I have appreciated greatly about the view since moving here, um, at least one thing that, first thing that popped up to my mind was the farmer's market. And the only reason is because you really could walk around it on Saturday morning and you will see everyone from the community coming, you know, from Asbury, from the different neighborhoods downtown, Fiesta, coming down for the farmer's market and, you know, just walking around and enjoying the bright Saturday morning. I've always really appreciated that. That was one of the first indicators of somebody who is not uh, a natural debuter that this place has a strong sense of community. I mean, you see people just enjoying their time around other people. So that definitely is something that, as, as an outsider, I've appreciated about the people. Definitely agree with that, uh, Enoch on that. And one of the things I would also add is within this community, uh, within the debut community, we're looking to get everyone connected, right? I think the, the passion of the community is so uh, as you can see with these events that have been held for the community foundation of the TH, and uh, thank you for the team for being part of this as well, is there is still that passion of how do we get our community together? Um, is it starts with getting that information, that knowledge, right? When it comes to neighborhood associations, it's an opportunity for you to connect with your neighbors, right? Uh, the more that you're connected with your neighborhood, the more that you know your neighbors, the safer that you feel, the sense of community that you start to build because you get that belonging. And so I think what's really great that's been going on is just the connectivity uh, and the initiative to try and create uh, neighborhood associations to get people to and that's also something that you'd say people should work on. Is that is that where you're going? As far as what what do we need to work on? Um, I think working on is maybe just awareness that that if there's if you don't uh, know your neighbors, if you don't know other people, just to uh, break the wilderness and be able to meet other people that are different from you, to have that courage, to have that uh, openness to not to create a divider, but to break down those barriers. So I think just working on being able to uh, hold hands with strangers and get to know someone else. Like you said in my intro, uh, being in a wheelchair has kind of changed the way that I look at the world again. And while I was involved in lots of different communities in Dubuque, I decided that I wanted to maybe plug in places where I can kind of inform and educate people about disabilities and a lot of times those new communities and places that I have plugged into um, I'm 
the only one that rolls in in a wheelchair. And while I find people are willing to listen and they want to hear what I have to say, um, we're, we're different, uh, different than that. I'm a disabled one, but they're willing to listen and figure out how can we make the view. Maybe a little bit. my safety perspective comes a little different from, you know, do we have the safe parking? Do we have safe streets and, and, and curb cuts and building accessibility issues? Um, and just how can we open our eyes and look at those maybe a little differently? So I was born and raised in Dubuque, so there's, of course, the Dubuque staples and events. Um, Taste of Dubuque, you can have the chili cook-off, and there's a ton more. Um, so in that sense, we do a great job where we love to keep traditions alive, and we hold true to our traditions. But how can we welcome new traditions and new cultures and new festivals? And I think that's one area where we can do better, is support those that are looking to bring that into the community whether they be attending them or helping plan them, um, how can we just be not only a sounding board, but how can we do it with them and not for them as well? So I think just expanding um, on cultural opportunities that are bigger than what we've had here in Dubuque and continue to support those in the best way we can. I think one of the questions that I, I want to ask is, how do we build a sense of community, especially across differences? Have any examples of doing that in the community? Well, actually, uh, I thought when you hit the nail right on the head, uh, you know, I'm part of the Latin committee that you know, we, we speak to our community. We threw the fiesta. Last year's was successful because it was a heavy involvement of the Latinos that are here in the view, and they felt a sense of community again. A lot of them have said that they hadn't felt that sense of community since you know the packing company had shut its doors way back when. Um, they I hadn't seen some people for over 15 years, even though sometimes they attend the same church. Just being aware and being able to go to these community events that largely are free, but you just gotta go find a parking spot, walk over to them, go to them, and would, would do such a tremendous service to your fellow neighbor, to your fellow neighbor that, yeah, they were not born in the view. Chances are they were born somewhere else. Chances are they're from another country, in fact. That would do such a service for them to see that there's that mutual respect. Because that's where it really goes to when we go to these events together, is I have a mutual respect for you. And when I have that underlying mutual respect for you, that means I can be a neighbor and a good neighbor with you. I want to, I want to push a little bit. What about for the viewers who were people born and raised here that are saying, well, how do we get them to come to us and enjoy our community? That's a great question. You know, that one's going to have a lot of nuance, and, and I can't even give you a full answer because for them, they want to be a part. We want to be a part. Um, but it's the question of how can we be a part of it. Um, you know what? I'm gonna, I'll address it right away, especially for the Latino community. A scary thing is immigration. A scary thing is sticking our neck out too far and knowing how far can we stick our neck out in a community to where we still feel safe. Those are genuine questions, so it does make it difficult. Now, I can tell you for certainty, speaking for the community, there is no lack of desire for wanting to be a part of the Dubuque community. They, they want their kids to go to the schools here. They want their kids to grow up here, be able to go to Flora or Sutton Pool in the summer. They want their kids to enjoy the farmer's market in the summer, to enjoy you know, sundown in the winter. They, they love the community that you does offer, and they feel that, but there is that, that level of, I don't fully speak English, and I'm not sure if I can trust you yet, because there are too many examples around me where I don't think I can trust you. For me, it's been a lot about humbling myself, so realizing that I don't have all the answers, I make mistakes, I fumble, um, here and there, and it's okay to say that. So if you meet someone new, asking about their culture and genuinely saying, I don't know, and that may be hard to say, but it's something you have to do. And I've experienced that myself. When COVID happened, we were providing food for Marshallese communities, and we were fumbling through the, same, the whole thing. So we had to invite them to the table and ask, what do you need? And how, how can we work with you to make sure that we're meeting your um, and then when we make mistakes, say, okay, we realize we made this mistake.
mistake, how can we fix it next time? Um, so I think that's really important is just humbling yourself and say, I feel stupid saying this, but I really just don't know. So please educate me um, because I don't want to act like I know something that I don't. I would encourage a, a shift of mindset of not so much of, hey, they need to join us, but a lot of us, you know, enjoy going on vacation. Well, how many of us enjoy going on vacation and traveling, right? So whenever we look at different destinations and locations, we're excited about going to experience something new. Right? And when we travel, when we get out there, we find a little different part of ourselves. And that's the same thing within the community when you start to see other people, is you start to discover a little bit more about yourself, more than your curious, you know, uh, hearing your story and find out uh, what's kind of going on with them. And it's not a so much of a relation to join us, it's like how can we, you know, create this beautiful message of ours that we can like the stream itself. And in order for us to uh, really have this at the start of the stream, have to do this allow and have that space for everyone for those that want to call the home to be able to do that and not feel like they have to fit uh, a certain mold, but the fact that they fit into the are arriving at their authentic self. Ms. Warrior, I want to invite you into the conversation because you and I, it seems like we go way back. And the sense of community and safety, as you mentioned earlier, is different, especially in your new role um, in life. Um, if you had a, an experience within the city, um, can you talk about that and how that has impacted you? I actually asked Anderson if I had permission to tell the story ahead of time. Uh, one of the ways that I decided to get involved was last spring, I did the City Life program. I wanted to learn more about city government and see where I could plug in. As a result of that, um, I am now on the City Park Direct Commission, and I'm also on an uh, advisory committee with Anderson's office for, um, to, to look at disability and view. But the very first night of City Life, um, we were meeting at the, the second floor of the federal building, the post office building. And I arrived a little late because there was a circus going on at Five Flags and I could not find a place to park. So after I finally found a place, because I have a van with a ramp on it, so there's no certain place to park. So I rolled in the federal building, I'm already late, a little bit nervous, and I got to the room on the second floor where we were supposed to meet, and Anderson welcomed me and said, roll in, and we found out the wheelchair would not fit through the door. While the doorway was wide enough, 36 inches that is required for ADA, um, the hinges of the door, the door could not swing all the way open and the hinges were blocking, it was not really 36 inches. Of course, at that moment I felt embarrassed and I'm like, I, that's okay, I can just go home. And Anderson and his staff graciously regrouped and moved everyone out of that room. We moved to another room, they had to move all the food for the night. But what Anderson later shared with me was that experience really opened their eyes of, you know, we need to make sure every, because every night the city life meets in a different location. And so they would look, but they, I didn't know this at first, it was a couple weeks in when he told me the story, but they then looked at every site we were meeting at and addressed, is that accessible? Another example, tonight when I was asked to be on this panel, I right away thought, they're gonna want the panelists up on the stage. And so I asked about steps, and sure enough, we figured there was too many steps, and so that's why we're down on the floor here, and I appreciate that because of me, but just people being aware that are not disabled, to, to look at some of those things and, and keep those things in mind. But I also want to connect it to the safety component, because you mentioned there was a time where you visited a building, I won't name the building, just in case they're watching, and for whatever reason, were unable to get inside the building. Can you talk about that experience? It was another place I was advocating for disabilities and had a meeting at their office and pulled up and the parking spot, you know, ADA is guidelines, but it doesn't always relate to real world, but what, what's really needed. Um, pulled up and there was, while well, it had the dash lines next to the parking spot, there was not enough room to deploy my ramp. And so I had to call them and, and um, figure out, literally I had to find someone to back, well I back my van out and I get out of the van and then someone else has to park my car. 
Then we get to the door of the facility, and while it had a ramp going up to it, the concrete had settled. And there was about an inch and a half, and I couldn't get in the building. I had to be pushed in the building. So just little things said that, that while they might meet ADA requirements if they were inspected, maybe aren't exactly the safest in terms of what really is needed for a disabled person. Well, I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing that story. We do have some additional questions. I want to throw out a hot one that Chief, if you don't mind answering. Um, I'm going to read it word for word. How are we addressing the fact that blacks, people of color, are charged with crimes more often than the white population? I think the number you saw, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the incidents, right? Or arrest? Offenders, okay. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's the question of it, you know, and I, I looked at numbers and I, I, I cringe, you know, because I know this, this is a issue. Uh, you know, what, how do we address that? You know, and what we look at is this, we have to look at, are we practicing fairly? Are we doing what we do policing fairly? Are we listening? And I think that just the previous discussion we've come out of this, we need to listen. What are people saying? What's important to people? What are they saying? You know, I, I, again, the, the perception of reality, but there's this, I, I, if I feel like I'm being treated as fair, we need to look at that. You know, and we have to have to look at it in the policing profession. Um, you know, I, I don't, you know, you saw the comparison, but I don't think this is really unique to Dubuque. I think this is, again, a nationwide wide issue, but Dubuque is what I'm here for. So Dubuque is what I, I'm going to talk about. And this is the numbers we're going to look at, and not going to look at. We look at these numbers. We look at the idea, uh, again, are our practices fair? But one of the ways we do that is, um, we're CALEA accredited. So we have 484 standards that get looked at every year. Now what do we do with that? We have good, best, and better practices. We partner with our, our community. We, we want to listen. If you've seen our officers out and about, um, they're at a lot of events. And part of that is they can, they can listen and, and hear what's going on. Uh, you know, when you talk about the violent, violent offenses here, on that, I will point out with violent offenses, that's pretty reactionary for us. We're not proactively out searching for people committing violent offenses. It, it is a reaction. This is what's getting reported to us on this. Now, where we look at the, the data, are we fairly arresting people? You know, are we equally doing that? Are we saying, I'm going to give them a pass because of their skin color? That is one area that that's concerning, and that's what I watch on that. Um, you know, I would lie if I said it probably doesn't happen that. We all have bias. We all have bias. And so we have to try to minimize the human bias or recognize the human bias that even our officers, our officers are people, right? We spend a lot of time training our officers on their bias, on their own bias. So they recognize that when they're charged, when they're making arrests, when they're addressing crime, recognize what they're bringing to the table already that may affect the outcome. And so this is an area that for us as the yeah, police, yeah. we can try to mitigate that effect. And again, it, is, it shows us, and this is the area that we have to have to really keep an eye on and really make sure that we are doing what we can as, as the police force and as uh, as people and, and to um, recognize what we're bringing to that table and making sure we're, we're doing our job in a fair and equitable manner. Chief, this question is, is kind of similar related to, you mentioned how often the officers are out and about at events, and of course, when you talk about the community or into policing, um, but this is asking specifically, what about walking the beat? Would, would, would an officer on foot patrol an area that might be a problem area? Yeah, and, and we have done that, and we do that. So you know, the community oriented policing, the yellow shirts, you see them around, they're on bikes. Uh, you know, community policing, if you didn't know this, has been around since the early 1800s. It's just how it's been played out, right? It came really in vogue in the late late 80s, early 90s as a, as a topic, but the beat officer, you know, those of you who've been around here, I guarantee you anybody who lived here in the 1950s saw an officer walk on the beat, right? And they're, they're swinging their key into the call box. We also have to, so we have a pretty big area to cover. 
So we also have to have response time. So if we have officers out on foot in an area, you know, and they get a call, we have to get, you want us to get there quick. So that, that's the thing we got to kind of weigh when we talk about putting officers on it. But we, where we kind of change this is the officers being out in the community. We want officers to be, and I talk about neighbors, we want officers to be on a first name basis with people. That's, I strongly encourage our officers to do that. Learn who the people are. They work pretty much the same assigned territories. They're a little bit big. We have seven currently territories that we cover. Uh, but we encourage the officers to get out, to get to know people on a first name basis. Um, again, encourage our officers and, and even assign our officers to various events throughout the community. Uh, there's rarely a, a big event or even something small that we don't have, don't have an officer at. Not because of the security aspect, just because of the community policing aspect. Get to know your cops. Cops get to know the people that you are. Because it's effectively from the safe community side, in order for this to really work, it has to be a collaborative effort. It can't be us telling you all the time. Chief, I'm going to grab you a beer because there's more questions for you, so we'll give you a break. Um, but how does food play a role in helping to build a sense of community? Can anyone talk about that? I think, well, for me, food is my passion, so this is where I get really excited and giddy. Um, I think food is one of the most important pieces to building community. Um, when you think a lot about our daily lives, what do we do when we want to meet with friends? We meet with them at a coffee shop, or we grab lunch, or dinner, and we hop in our car to do so, right? It's easy, it's simple, it's accessible, we can go wherever we want. There are many in our community that don't have that safe luxury of hopping in a car, and it's that simple. Um, so where are we placing restaurants? Where are we opening coffee shops? Um, where are we creating gathering spaces for those that their primary transportation is walk or bike? And how are we making sure they can walk or bike safely? Do we have complete streets? And I, I think that's such an important piece. And we've seen the impact certain spaces like this have created in our, in our community, and Convivium is one of them. The vibrancy that you see there, the community that they're building around the gardens, how they're welcoming people in on a daily basis. So bringing more spaces like that scattered throughout the community in areas where they may not have access to the same resources that we just take for granted and we're able to enjoy every day. It's one of the reasons why we created the Rooted Table, um, which is a farm to street community dinner that's free to the community was to not only bring awareness on how we can bring people together, but also showcase neighborhoods that may be overlooked. Um, so we, our first year was in the Green Bee Branch, this year was in the Washington Park, or Washington Street neighborhood, where we showcased the Washington Garden, a place that many in our community did, didn't even know was there. So just really showcasing different areas and how we can bring people together. And you think about growing up too, like one of your favorite things as a child was probably having a neighborhood barbecue or a neighborhood party. So how are we encouraging different neighborhoods to start creating those things? How are we getting neighborhoods together? How are we starting that initiative um, as individuals? Are you gonna say something or? Yeah, no, I did have one, yeah. So uh, I was there for the Rooted Table event at uh, Whitney Throne and it was beautiful, it was amazing. Um, I believe that that question and then the previous question that you had asked the chief kind of they start to go hand in hand a little bit. Um, you know, talked a little bit about Maslow's hierarchy of needs a little bit at the beginning, and food is a need. Food is something that's been a need for the entire existence of our species. With that being said, uh, there is an obvious food desert specifically in this part of the view. Now, if you were to look at the map of the view. You take the Mississippi River, and then you use that as the border, and this is go out to Asheville. Well, the border of where the supermarkets start and end is really right where Grandview is, and then west. Everything down here, there's only one supermarket. That causes a couple of issues. If you're a business major, you know right away there's no competition in one region, so without that type of competition, price doesn't matter anymore because you're not forced to drop the prices. The majority of the at least the minority citizens that live in this area either have one vehicle or no vehicle, reliant on the jewel bus or reliant on that vehicle getting back on time if it's even working at that moment. Um, so something that definitely would make the chief's job easier, especially uh, bringing down those, those numbers of calls that he has to take, I mean, it would be to 
encourage another supermarket in this area. And I am speaking from the perspective of a Latino who did live down here and spoke to the families down here. Simply, be, simply because when food is not met, other issues arise. Because that's a survival need. That's a need that we, we need to get at. There is no shortage of restaurants in this area. There are many restaurants, many amazing restaurants. Actually, to go back to the first question about community and what the community does right with community is the support of small local restaurants. I think that's a beautiful thing that the city does have. But more supermarkets would immediately work into less crime for the chief. Now, it's just one vehicle. That's not the be all end all. But that one vehicle would go a long way. And supporting projects like Whitney's Project and Convivium. I mean, having farm fresh food, we are surrounded by farms. That, that, those little itty bitty pieces are things that at least my community has voiced to be issues that they want to address. So I guess that's more of a call to the lawmakers in the city uh, to see what they can do in those regards. Well, speaking of lawmakers, from anyone can jump on this, what could the city do, our local legislators, I truly believe all politics start local, what could the city of Dubuque do, do better to help build a sense of community? Think about the people that you're connected with. Yes, we're doing everything right. Mike is watching. Yes. Okay, I'll keep talking like I am. Look, what can the city do more? Well, I mean, I do like the idea of the neighborhood associations bringing those neighborhoods together to work together. Um, what else can the city as a local government do? Well, encourage the supermarket to take that space where the packing company used to be. That would be one good start. That's within walking distance of this downtown area. Um, the only other supermarket that is in this like lower part of the view below the hill is Local Street High Beam. If you're walking, it's inaccessible. You're not, you're not gonna cross US 20, especially if you're walking. Now, I'm speaking from a point of privilege as someone who was born and raised in the Bronx, and you can get to any supermarket that you wanted to walk in distance just fine. I understand that part. But it goes back to what I was saying. Having a food desert does tie back into the crime and what people do in order to do what they have to do. Um, so what can the city do? Well, in my opinion, in the opinion of this, the buker that's living here now 10 years, yeah, encourage one of the supermarkets to take that large space that's there. Um, did, I did find it discouraging that all these wanted to take a space that's right off of US 20. It's like, we already have 10 supermarkets out there. Put one down here. I'd say, I would say what the uh, city can do better would be, uh, I'd invite for community members to be a part of city life. So city life, as Lori mentioned, is an opportunity for community members to meet with different city departments and ask you know, direct questions. Right, and also voice some concerns or also celebrate some great things that are happening that they're experiencing. So for the city to do better, uh, we want to hear from community members and uh, encourage them to know that there is that uh, opportunity. Uh, if you don't know how, again, I'll shout out for City Life. Uh, we're starting in April 4th, and so it's a six, uh, six session, three week program. And we encourage for community members to get engaged with different boards and commissions. That's another way of us being able to improve because um, if you have some ideas uh, or something creative, you can have as a person. To piggyback off that, I stole my comments, but you know, I mentioned I did city life and, and, and then got involved in some different areas of government. And I have really found in the short time that I've been involved, people really do want to hear what you have to say. But you've got to bring those people to the table. Um, just a very small example, um, on the Park and Rec Commission, we had a meeting last night and we were talking about um, one of the bathrooms in Eagle Point Park is being completely redone. And of course, I'm always the voice of, of, of disability and I, I brought up, you know, what are the specs, size of that, and the uh, park director, uh, the director of parks, um, he's going to look up what they use for a model of what is a handicap accessible bathroom and, and make sure that we're using that in the future. I know that is a very small example, but um, I really feel like getting more people involved in government so their voices can be heard instead of maybe complaining about what isn't being heard. And on that note, I was asked to um, uh, the, the 
City Dubuque is doing a little campaign on getting involved in, in the city and ask me uh, to talk about that. And I really encourage, you know, there are lots of places people can plug in, they just don't realize that average people like me can be part of that process. I have a question here that I guess this is probably a place to question, but anybody can jump in. As we're talking about the downtown area, I think this is kind of interesting. Uh, this person writes, when we moved to Dubuque two years ago, we wanted to live in a safe neighborhood. It seemed from coverage in the Telegraph Herald that downtown and the north end of downtown are less safe and more likely to have crime. So is that just a perception? You know, and this is where the bomb rap is, because you look at the data, it's going to show up more crime down Why is that? More people. Closer proximity. These are the numbers. Also, if you look at the numbers, it'll show downtown uh, as a hot spot. It's going to show it. You know where the biggest area is? Around the law enforcement center, because of the walk-in calls. So you look at these numbers, and so you, you do get, again, and, and this is, since I've been here, and I was one of the white cops advocating for these neighborhoods to say, yeah, they're, they're great neighborhoods, they're great people, and you know, it does look like this is this is unsafe, but this is where the most people are in, in closest proximity. And again, um, yeah, you're going to see more of that, but again, I, I can vouch for that. I believe it's safe. I think a lot of this starts with a conversation about. Like myself as a, a native Dubuque, how am I talking to my children? How am I talking to those that are coming to the community? I worked in tourism for Travel Dubuque for quite some time, and there was never a bad neighborhood. We never once wanted to portray that, and that comes with people coming into our community to live as well. So instead of speaking with that language, talking about the history and the heritage of the different spaces that we have in the community, the space being one of them, what did we uncover through this? A church that was going to get torn down and now it's a beautiful space uh, for the community. So how are we showcasing these different areas in a positive light and communication and conversation starts with us? From the person that's coming into our community to the children to those we interact with on a daily basis because we can change the conversation. It's just up to us to start. And this could be for anyone, but Chief, I'll go ahead. One more thing with that. You know, I came to the view and I have um, friends uh, now and, and in-laws, my wife is from here, and you hear this, don't go, I don't go east of Bluff, no way. And he asked why. Oh man, I'm going to get robbed. We saw the statistics that, that showed there. The other thing I would point out, how many people come downtown to go to Five Flags, go out to eat, go to all this stuff? We all do that. As a holistic, just a conversation, I think it, Wendy is saying this, yeah, people are like, I ain't going, I ain't going east to us. No way. And, and, but we do it all the time. And, and, and again, back to that, how many people have been robbed or been a victim of that just because they've been east to bluff? And so it, it gets such a bad rap for that. And, and that's a, uh, and it is, it is such a vibrant, wonderful area to, to be in, in all areas of the I'm going to uh, kind of paraphrase this, this question because it's talking about higher uh, public officials and the challenges with them not believing that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a problem um, at the local level or at the state level. Is there anything that we can do to navigate those challenges? And specifically, it's talking about how do we fight back uh, with the governor who doesn't believe in, in equities, it's no longer funding, DEI efforts. Is there anything that we can do, or, or is there anything that's already being done at the local level? I would say that, to that point, you know, again, and I'm going to use my background, I come from a you know, major city like New York that, that has, uh, you know, an eclectic culture of very groups around the world. You know, the beauty is starting to really enter that world. Um, I don't remember the DEI project being a thing in the city of New York growing up. Um, my, my mother was a public school teacher, so I would have been privy to any programs that they were having to do. They would have had some, but nothing at the rate that we're experiencing today, not that there's anything wrong to that. But the point that I'm going to try and drive home here is that sense of community and that sense of mutual respect. Um, you know, Temwa was uh, giving you know, the information about City Connect. I think that's one phenomenal way that 
fellow Ruthers can get to know what the city government does. But I think one great way that our city officials and lawmakers and then those that are prominent believers can be a part of the rest of us that are here is by going to a lot of these events. Um, more so because it shows a level of mutual respect. It shows at least some respect. Uh, the MFC does a phenomenal job of throwing events for the Marginese community, for the Indian community, for the Latino community, for the black community. Those communities themselves are throwing other events as well. Just showing that mutual respect of, hey, you know what, I'm not 100% sure about you, or 100% sure about where you come from, but I would love to learn, or I'm at least here to learn something. And if I'm not here to learn, then maybe I'll ask a question or two. Just that mutual respect, is, it, it would go a tremendous distance that, in my opinion, and I'm going to stress my opinion, and my opinion can go a little bit further than many of the DEI programs that, that exist and are required of either state, city, or local level uh, governments and government programs. It's just reaching across the table and meeting each other where they're at. Let's meet each other where we're at. Um, I really appreciate what the police chief said that he's heard people say that I'm not going to go waste the blood. But yet, he says, we still as a community come down to events like the Five Flags or the Farmers Market and so on and so forth. You know, so that, that gives me confidence as, a, as someone who's living in the viewers of the viewer that, hey, my police chief is, uh, he, he's down to come downtown and, and break bread with me and, and shake my hand and get to know who we are. So seeing more of that would go a very, very long way. You know, I really love what you said, and uh, I don't think Rick Dickinson, he is here. Today. I'm not going to say this just because we're here. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, he was asked a similar question by the city council about the home at the state level. He looked at the city council members and he said, you're looking for hope outside of the building, we'll find it. We are the hope that we're looking for. And so, how do we fight back? It's events like this, and us being engaged intentionally. And as you mentioned, when diverse communities are having events, be intentionally involved. Even if it makes you uncomfortable, go after that discomfort and see where the hope is. Chief, I know you were going to say something. Yeah, I, not to, I don't want to oversimplify, but it starts with the individual. One person at a time. That's how we start addressing the yeah. One person at a time. It takes the individual, it takes self awareness, it takes people looking at it. So. There's a question behind you. I do got to ask you this question too. What are we doing for officers that are dealing with various traumas? Do we have any support systems for them? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. It, it's, it's a tough time to be an officer right now um, for a number of reasons. Uh, but what we're doing, and this is, I wish I would have had this 30 years ago when I started in law enforcement. We do a, a lot of layers. First, we start off with that. One person at a time. It's an individual. We start with the, the emotional intelligence part. That's one of our, our core beliefs of the new police department, being self-aware, self-management. And we also then encourage officers to look out for each other. Uh, just on the, again, just, they know each other. They work with each other. They see things that I don't see. But the, then, more formally, we have a peer support group. Our peer support group is just officers. They're bound by confidentiality. I don't get to know what they, they talk about, but I know last year, the peer support group within our own department um, had 208 contacts. So roughly 100 officers, 208 contacts, they're busy um, talking about, about things going on. Then we have other things, we have, we have other things in the, uh, the community. Um, we have, um, obviously we have various uh, treatment facilities, but we also have uh, employee assistance programs. So we have all these layers, we have a chapter program, we have layers so people can connect. They may not like the peer support, so they may connect in other ways. That's the way we're dealing with that. That's amazing, and I know it's a hard time to be a minority these days, too. What are you doing to connect with them? Is there like a chief form or anything to be able to connect with residents? Yeah, and, and that's exactly, uh, it is about connecting. Again, Anderson had said, let's get outside your comfort zone. You know, be in places where um, you are the minority. You know, and, and, I, and, and I've done that, and it is, it is a strange feeling being, being white, being male, being middle aged, to be in that, and to where I'm at. It is, but it's so rewarding. So there is a way you can connect with us. Again, we, we want to connect. We have a police academy that's going on right now. Um, we have for the kids, maybe this camp, 
We have all these events that we participate in, um, and we love to hear from you. We love to engage the, engage the community. Uh, the Chief Forum, this is something we're trying to get, we had a little bit of COVID break here, obviously, that traction of people moving in it, we had a change in, in, uh, from the previous chief, but this is something you want people to bring in a topic. So the downtown, the Chief Dawson was here, this is the Chief Forum was working on how do we rebrand the downtown with, with the group. I mean, it's really one of these areas that, uh, and, and it's, it's so important. And so, again, connect with us, it's just, again, being approachable, and they don't want uniform that would be not approachable. I want people to be able to say, I want people to come up to me and not say, Chief, I want people to come up and say, Jeremy, how are you doing? Or Jeremy, let's talk about this. That's what I want. That's where we connect. Great. Wrapping up here, let's have final thoughts. So so tell me, uh, this is your opportunity. If you want to say something to the community, what, what parting thought would you leave folks with? One, maybe it's a call to action. Uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's just an idea, but go ahead. Let's let's hear some final thoughts. All right, I'll start. The first thing, I, the only thing I'll say with this, and, and this is the way it's, it starts with a wave. How many people wave at your neighbor every day? It starts with a wave, and literally starts there, and that's what I'm leaving with. My biggest thing, just growing up here in Dubuque, is finding your passion and finding something that makes you excited, that's easy to talk about, that's easy to connect with. For me, it was food. So how can I connect with the community through food? So whether it be planning events, or um, whether it be through food, or whether it be through just safe neighborhoods and transportation, find that area that you're most connected with and find the people that are working toward the same goal. I think that's one of the biggest things for me is just Find what makes you happy and jump in on the initiative that goes with it. I feel like I've kind of already said this, but, but getting out of your comfort zone and getting involved, you know, um, thinking that your voice doesn't matter and, they, and, and I, I don't have the skills to get involved in that group or, or I don't have anything to say, that to push yourself out of your comfort zone and, and you, you would be rewarded with people who want to hear what you have to say. I'd just like to encourage everybody to get involved um, any way that you can. I highly um, encourage for our neighborhood associations because there we have a lot of great associations that are established, and there's probably one within your proximity. If there's not one, uh, feel free to contact us at the Office of Shared Prosperity, and we'd love to get one started with your neighborhood. And that's an opportunity again for where we can have city departments or other organizations come to you and uh, give you some information or resources that you're looking for. But another way that you can also get active within where you already live, putting on your own cleanups, doing some barbecues, uh, and some other great things where you can get to uh, meet your neighbors around and just build that sense of community. Just go around, just go around. Correct, and we do all, also, uh, we love to invest within our neighborhoods, so we do have a small grant of $750 that uh, whatever community looks like to you, we want to work with you. Um, we can't put the events on for you, but we would love to do it with you and invest within your area. You know, uh, it was repeated a couple times to get out of the comfort zone. Now, as I'm looking out into this crowd, uh, immediately I can see that, like most of you have been the papers all your life, and that, like we have seen the ever changing uh, culture and dynamics and demographics of the view. Um, but what I definitely see here are probably the leaders of your own family and the leaders of your own community, whether that community lives in North End, West End, Asbury, or Piazza, whatever that case may be. You know, what you can definitely do, what you can definitely do is be, be that leader that goes back home tonight and says, hey, let's check the MFC website. Let's check the MFC website and see what event do they have coming up and let's go to it. Hey, let's see uh, what's going on in the city. Let's see what we can do. Everybody here, I can tell, is a leader. I think there's them telling me I'm talking to you. No, no, you're, you're good. Everybody here is a leader in their community and in their family. And I do believe that in being a leader of your community and your family, you can go back home tonight and say, hey, let's actually do something. Tell your kids, your grandkids, your family members, hey, the Latin Fiesta is September 30th. Once again, it is September 30th. <laughs> let's go to it. 
It's down by the smokestack, right across from the courthouse and the police station. Let's go to it. Let's try some, you know, some food that we haven't tried and talk to people that we've never met. Let's try something different. I know that everyone here has the ability to do that, and I think that those small steps then make the chief's job easier and it makes our community closer and safer at the end of the day. I want to thank our panelists. This has been a really great group. We've all shared so much, and I really appreciate it. Chief Charity, Whitney, Lori, Tamwa, Ina, thank you so much for being here and for all you're doing for the community. Uh, there's food back there. Please, uh, Big Red, here's your chance to, to, to get to know some folks right here. So thanks for coming out. Go ahead, Bob. All right. Help me. All right, Bob, you alive? Please help me thank uh, Amy and, and Anderson for facilitating tonight. I want to thank you all for all the questions. Yesterday, we didn't get to all of them. Thank you very much for submitting those and sharing. Here are some of my takeaways for tonight. And uh, actually, I'm going to. Whitney stole one of my things, but you know, uh, I think some of the things that I heard tonight is that, first of all, you're, you're not likely to get uh, accosted by someone you don't know. You're, you're just, you're just, uh, crime for strangers is, 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 uh, is rare in Dubuque, in Iowa. And we have heard a lot of other good uh, data that uh, the numbers have gone down there. General, we heard that brain health and the pandemic were huge, and part of the reason that there was a little bit of a spike. But for the most part, Dubuque is better than the rest of the country, and one of the better uh, towns in the, in the state of Iowa. So, comparatively speaking, a pretty safe place to live. Um, one of the things uh, I also heard is we need to know our neighbors better, and I think it's not just our neighbors. I think it's good to know the people in our neighborhood, but I think it's also just as important that. More to know people in other neighborhoods. Yeah, so you heard uh, get out of your comfort zone, what, about half a dozen times tonight? Um, I think that's like the mantra. And uh, what I, the interesting thing that I heard tonight was, and I think uh, maybe you not mentioned this, by the way, thank you for referencing the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need for <laughs> insightful uh, <laughs> ratification. Um, be a stranger. For those of you like me who are native to Bukers, Long time to viewers, whatever it is. That's for sure. How about if we get out of our comfort zones and maybe be a stranger in our own town? So treat it like you're traveling, okay? Let's go someplace that you haven't been before. Meet some people that you haven't met before. Try some food that you haven't had before. Go to some neighborhoods that you haven't been to before. Uh, so those were, and food is a common theme here. That was the one that I actually had circled and Whitney highlighted and I think she's spot on. I think food is a great way to uh, make friends and meet new people. And food, food itself might be different, but even people you're eating with might be different. And that's okay. We should embrace that. Um, you know, we heard a little bit about uh, getting involved with neighborhood associ associations and maybe see if we can find uh, a way to bring more food options within walking distance or jewel uh, distance or biking or whatever it is for, for neighborhoods that don't have their food deserts and they don't have ready access. Um, so those are some of the ones that I heard tonight. Um, and uh, so finding your passion. What I love also too is, is that you know, if, you, if your passion is to, that crosses lines. Um, you don't have to uh, always be doing that with the same old folks. So, some good takeaways tonight. There are more. We'll have those at our uh, um, ending session and also put them on our website. But I do want to thank again our sponsors tonight, starting uh, with our main sponsor. Please help me welcome and appreciate and uh, thank the uh, Chamber of Commerce. So, Sully, thank you. Bob, I'm sure you Also, John Deere, Green State Credit Union, Greater Youth Development, um, Northeast Iowa Community College, Hodge, and some things, some takeaways, some things for you tonight. Amy mentioned getting together and talking to some people. Please grab our panelists tonight, visit with them or your neighbors here at some of the tables. But um, we also have the Community Foundation's Community Conversations. Those are going to be starting here in the next few weeks, and they might already be starting. 
not sure about that. So please, uh, I think they're on your tables. Please take advantage of that. Um, you heard some action items from me here. We talked about the sponsor, the uh, sponsors. Um, and then lastly, there's probably some food, some other things to drink here yet. So please enjoy those. Thank you for coming tonight. Three weeks from tonight, on April 12th, we will be back here. It's also a Wednesday. We will be talking about transportation, especially public transportation. That is the uh, last of our seven series. So please come here in three weeks. We'll see you then. In the meantime, thank you for coming. Good night.